Now this updates actually about Sweden, but I'm told that this picture was taken in uh, Nashville, Tennessee on the 12th of June. And who knows, you might see yourself in that picture. Now, if you are in that picture and you're watching this video, then I really don't think there's much point me telling you anything. But uh, if you are prepared to listen, my suggestion would be that you uh, self-isolate for 14 days because you may have contracted the virus. Now, the reason I'm showing that this morning is the report today is on Sweden. So we're looking at Sweden. But what's concerning me is that the approach that's been taken by Sweden, or indeed the approach that has not been taken by Sweden, is being duplicated by default, as we've just seen in that picture from, um, from Nashville. So let's look at the situation in, in Sweden now and, and see what's going on. Now, the jury has sort of been out on the situation in Sweden for some time, really. Um, and you might remember that way back in February, we did an interesting interview or, or there was a video report from a senior medical student in in Sweden that said Sweden was carrying out an experiment. Well, the results of that experiment are, are in now. And uh, or to put it another way, the ju jury has filed back in and has given its verdict and the verdict's not good. So this is largely based on this study from the uh, British Medical Journal. Now, it's a. Uh, it's not so much as study, it's not really collecting data, it's collecting a variety of opinions and views. But it's well referenced to uh, individual senior people in Sweden. So do read it for yourself. And basically it's asking, has the Swedish strategy been successful or not? That's the question. So think about the measures, first of all, in Sweden. Schools close to under 16, so they did do that eventually. Uh, gatherings of more than 50 discouraged. More than 50 discouraged? It's not a very stringent method, is it? Bars, restaurants and other public spaces remain open, um, but citizens were trusted to distance themselves. That was the approach. Now, this is in stark contrast to the countries round about Denmark, Sweden, sorry, Denmark, Norway and Finland, the countries round about Sweden, who had much more uh, enforced vigorous lockdowns. So what was the intention? What was Sweden trying to do? And again, this has got such important implications for what's going on now in, in quite a few parts of the world, I think, whether as a deliberate strategy or whether, um, whether it is inadvertent, as we saw in Nashville. Um, so the intention in Sweden was uh, don't bother trying to contain the spread. Um, herd immunity is inherent in their strategy. Now, they never actually said this but it's just inherent in everything that was done in Sweden that they were going for this herd immunity strategy which allows a proportion of the population to become infected so that's what they were trying to do but that's at the expense of deaths among the vulnerable and it turns out that this is what has actually happened so that those intentions might not have been sort of declared in those frank stark terms but Clearly, that was the implications of the, uh, the Swedish strategy, uh, as I would interpret it. Um, you can interpret it differently, of course. But So the aim was this herd immunity. Now, herd immunity is going to occur when 50 to 90% of the population is infected. And, and therefore, there's a large degree of immunity in the population, which blocks ongoing transmission. Now, whether herd immunity is achieved at 50 or 90%, it is open to debate really with the COVID-19 virus but these figures depend on how uh, infectious the uh, infect the particular uh, viral outbreak in this case is so less infectious conditions you might reach herd immunity at as low as 50 percent highly infectious conditions you probably won't reach herd immunity till you get to 90 percent and the figures for COVID-19 are 70 to 80 percent the population of the vulnerable population uh, that, that is the people who could potentially catch this virus 70 to 80 percent of those will need to become uh, infected until there's a level of herd immunity and this is working on my working assumption that once someone has had the infection they will have a fair degree of immunity and i believe the evidence is accumulating in that direction 
although this is still not accepted fully by agencies such as the World Health Organization, but I believe they will in the next few weeks. So it depends on how contagious it is. And people have enough antibodies to repel the virus. So the whole point is the virus, which is the antigen, causes the immune system, the immune system in the body, to produce the antibodies. These antibodies then combat the virus and leave residual immunity to further viral infections of the same type of virus. The person has developed, developed active acquired immunity through developing antibodies, which are the immunoglobulins, these vital immune proteins. Now, the epidemiologist who was sort of uh, in charge of this, Andres Tegnell, Tegnell, <laughs> Um, they, uh, th 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 that this, this was the epidemiologist who was kind of the main architect of the Swedish grand plan. On the 26th of April, uh, he said, rise in infections is beginning to flatten and the infections have reached a plateau in Stockholm. So that was on the 26th of April. Of course, we're now well into June. So we're now in a position to see if this was correct. So was he correct? So for that, we look at the, uh, the graph. Now, this graph here goes from uh, January to June. So that puts April about here. So what we see in the short term, he was correct in the short term. But then when we get further on, we see a dramatic increase. So he was talking around about here, saying that rise infections begin to flatten, which they did and they even went down for a while. But he didn't seem to anticipate that this was going to happen. Uh, many people thought it was fairly obvious this dramatic rise was going to happen, but uh, this epidemiologist seemed to uh, to miss that. So we can now say that this statement was clearly, utterly, completely wrong. He got it wrong. Now, uh, a, a former state epidemiologist, uh, Anika Lindy, um, I think we're starting to see that Sweden model maybe wasn't the smartest. OK, so we're starting to see that the way the Swedish approach this was probably not the smartest. Um, uh, I think that's the evidence for that, isn't it? The uh, increase here. This is a linear scale. But we can see the, the magnitude of the increase and how wrong the original epidemiologist was. Uh, now, more than half the deaths in Sweden have been in care homes. So older people with pre-mobilities in care homes. Um, now, another thing about the Swedish strategy was they said that siblings of people, um, si siblings of, of people. So if there was someone sick in the family, their siblings could still go out, basically, is what they were saying. Because if, as long as the siblings were feeling well, so if, if, if one brother was sick in the household or a parent was sick in the household, for example, then uh, the person, other people in the household could still go out as normal because they were asymptomatic and asymptomatic people, of course, can't spread the disease. Or well, that's what they said. Uh, also, in my view, completely, utterly wrong. I think the evidence that asymptomatic people can spread this disease is now in place. Even the World Health Organization were umming and ahhing about this just last week. And I think the, they had to issue a statement of clarification saying that asymptomatic people and pre-symptomatic people can spread this virus. So again, another aspect of where, you know, these very clever people in Sweden, they, these people are epidemiologists and, and yet they got it completely um, wrong. Government advice implied asymptomatics, not contagious, dear me. The whole reason we have this pandemic is because pre-symptomatics and asymptomatics spread the disease. If we knew who had it, we could contain it much more easily. The, the naivety of that is really um, quite, quite impressive. Care home staff often worked with standard, uh, substandard protection. And this is the other key thing. Um, people in care homes often work when they themselves were developing symptoms. And of course, when people are first developing symptoms is when they are most contagious. So lots to learn from the Swedish situation, and there's more. Um, now, 
Increasing practice of doctors recommending by telephone palliative cocktails for sick and older people in uh, care homes. Now, let me give you a bit of the background here. What we have is, is, is a fairly standard thing, really. We have what we call end of care, end of life drugs. So when someone's at the end of life, they could be in a great deal of pain. They could be incredibly distressed. There's a condition called a terminal agitation where the, the person that is about to depart this life becomes intensely anxious and uh, agitated and uh, not a pleasant uh, situation to be in. So we have end of life drugs to treat this pain and to treat the mental pain as well that can be present. And we give these end of life drugs. Now, th th this is something I've done many times. I've given people these sort of um, morphine, uh, benzodiazepine based drugs many times and these medicines, sometimes people thrive on them actually. And then, then, you know, once you take away the pain, they actually do much better. But all medicines, of course, have side effects and uh, benzodiazepines and morphine are known to depress the respiratory system. So with drugs, we're prepared to accept um, side effects in, other, in order to get the beneficial effects that we're looking for. So w w when, I, when I've given these drugs... It, it, the vast majority of occasions I've been happy that, that I've been giving it uh, for indications of pain and if that did happen to accelerate death as a side effect then th 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 then that's something that, that, that my conscience is, 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 is actually fairly comfortable with um, it's not something I haven't uh, thought about um, so, so sometimes drugs that relieve symptoms I give the drugs to relieve the symptoms what, what though to me when it crosses the border into euthanasia is when you give these drugs deliberately to, to end life when you're not giving them for the indication of relieving symptoms. That is, that is the difference. That is the big difference in my mind. And uh, yeah, that, that's the big difference. Don't want to go too much into my experiences there. But, but, but that, that, that's what I found basically to be true over the years. Now, morphine and midazolam. Um, so so what, hap what was happening? It seems that increasing practice of doctors recommending by telephone palliative cocktails for sick and older people in care homes. If you talk to your, um, talk to your grandmother, she might remember a drug we used to give called Brompton's Cocktail. And that was one of these things, but we have more modern versions of that now. Brompton's Cocktail was basically alcohol, morphine and cocaine. So people would die feeling fairly jolly. Uh, almost euphoric indeed from the uh, cocaine uh, but without pain from the morphine so it's a very uh, very beautiful generous thing to do to someone in the end of life uh, end of life care we don't use the cocaine these days <laughs> right so morphine and midazolam uh, are the standard treatments there midazolam is a benzodiazepine it's in the same group of drugs as uh, valium that, that you're probably familiar with or, or librium the, these tranquilizer drugs which are remarkably useful for calming people down in the short term but the both especially morphine it has the side effect of inhibiting uh, respiration so so morphine does inhibit uh, breathing now this is this is a well-known side effect of morphine um, and you do see it so when you give someone morphine there can be some reduction in the in the respiratory effort and uh, one what I remember once giving someone intravenous diamorphine and um, they actually stopped breathing. It was really quite frightening. Now, that's very unusual. <laughs> I've, I've given intravenous morphine and dimorphine hundreds of times, and uh, someone only stopped breathing once. Now, it was okay. We, 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 they were fine. We were able to treat that because we were in a hospital situation with acute care facilities available, and I was able to, uh, to call on uh, highly senior medical staff within seconds. So it was all fine. Um, but to give these drugs without that sort of supervision in care home situations... Um, is, is a different situation but th this was apparently according to the BMJ uh, respondents uh, that was done the proportion of older people in respiratory care nationally was lower at the same time a year ago so not only were they giving people these respiratory depressants in care homes they weren't bothering to admit them to um, acute care facilities proportion of older people in respiratory care nationally was lower than at the same time a year ago so this is what is being reported from Sweden um, some might say this is a euthanasia policy 
Thousands of lives could be saved, uh, could have been saved if people in care homes with the virus received oxygen supplies. Now, again, this to me is is a vital point. And again, I'll explain the background here. Um, I hope you're still with it. But there's so, so many important points coming out in this video. Um, the background here is that, you know, even in the past two, three years, I've treated uh, many, many uh, older people in, in the last parts of their lives or well, not necessarily older people people with severe severe conditions and um, the point is even if someone is is old and uh, demented for example or they have uh, another condition then the certain now you're not you're not going to go and give that person a lung transplant or something you're not going to intervene officiously in that care you're not going to do dramatic treatments that like you might do for a 20 year old who who could potentially have many more years of useful life after that. You're not going to do that, but there's levels of intervention which I feel you must do. So uh, I have this situation at the moment with, with, with people I'm caring for and um, the, the, their long-term outlook is not good, but when they get an acute infection, I feel it would be morally wrong not to give antibiotics because if we didn't do that, the person would die within a few days. So these are simple things that we should do. So there's a level of interventions which is appropriate and, and it's clear in my mind to fall below a particular level of intervention, uh, simple interventions, is tantamount to euthanasia. Th that's clear in my mind, that, that's what my conscience is happy with. So to give basic interventions like intravenous antibiotics, like a couple of bags of intravenous fluids, I feel it will be unethical not to do that and I feel exactly the same for oxygen therapy. So some people with COVID-19 will survive if the only intervention you do is give them additional oxygen for a few days. Without that, they may have died. With a small amount of additional oxygen, just for maybe 24, 48 hours, or just for a few days, that they, they can survive. It's a very low tech, simple intervention to supplement the oxygen. These are simple interventions. And to me, not to do that is unethical and tantamount to euthanasia. That, that is what I feel about this. Uh, I can imagine the feedback I'm going to get already, but th there you go. Um, and w w what people in Sweden are saying is thousands of lives could have been saved if people in care home with the virus received oxygen supplies. So it appears from this that people died as a result of something as simple as having supplementary oxygen. And to me, that is tantamount to euthanasia. So these relatively simple interventions should be carried out even if people are in the later stages of life because um, not to carry them out would be tantamount to allowing that person to die. Um, now we don't, as, as I've said, we don't do invasive, you know, relatives at the moment I have, I'm not going to carry out inv or authorise invasive procedures to be carried out, but it will be unethical not to carry out these simple procedures and basically, any any uh, any junior healthcare provider is is more than capable of putting on oxygen or giving antibiotics. It's a very simple thing. Now, the results. <clears throat> now, it's important here to notice the populations. I'm just going to put me out of the way there so we can see this. It's important to see this. Um, now, here we are. Now. This is the population, Sweden 10.3 million, Norway 5.3, Finland 5.5, Denmark 5.7. So that's the population. And we're using these adjacent countries as comparison. This is the confirmed cases. So Sweden has had 51,000 confirmed cases, Norway 8,600, Finland 7,000, Denmark 12. And I think you can see that basically the population of Sweden is, is just a little under double. So um, by, by, by that token, Norway should have had about, Norway would have had about 16,000 cases per capita relative to the 51,000. Again, 14,000 relative to the 51,000, 24,000 relative to the 51,000. So we see that the results are that the number of cases in Sweden per capita is greatly increased. And this column here is deaths. So in Sweden so far, what are we now? The 15th of June, I think. Sweden's had 4,874 deaths. 
Norway has had 242. So even allowing, can you see, even allowing for the difference, so for the dif allowing for the difference, that would be what, 500 deaths that Sweden should have had, but they've had 5,800. Finland has had uh, 326 deaths, and Denmark has had 579, and Sweden has had 4,874. So I think we can see in terms of transmitting the disease, uh, Sweden's strategy has not been uh, th that successful here. Now I just have got so I've, I've just taken a note of some figures here that I want I want to give you as well. So um, so Sweden, the the, the deaths here actually equal um, 0.03 uh, percent of the whole population have died here. That's the number that have died so far in Sweden. But and it's a big but, perhaps only about 10% of the population of Sweden has been exposed and therefore has developed immunity. That means another 90% could still catch the infection. So if we extrapolate this up to a whole, a whole population deaths, that, that could, times that by 10, that could mean that we could expect about 0.3% of the entire population of uh, Sweden to die with this, with this strategy. Now conversely, in Norway, so far, that is 0.004% of the population that's died. And again, if we extrapolate that times 10, that will give a death rate of uh, 0.04. So we can see there that this strategy seems to increase the death rate by about 10 times from that data. Now, if we take a completely hypothetical country, uh, let's take a completely hypothetical country here. And then I've just made notes of this. This hypothetical country here uh, has a population of uh, uh, 328.2 million people as of the 2019 census. Completely a uh, hypothetical country. But a country which, hypothetically speaking, could be following de facto a similar uh, trajectory to Sweden. And if 0.3% of those die, as, as this could be in Sweden, that would equal 9, 8, 4, 6, 0, 0 deaths. Just under a million deaths could occur in this hypothetical country of 328 million people. Uh, let, let's, hope, let's hope I'm completely, uh, completely wrong about that. But uh, th these figures uh, are not, uh, not ludicrous. We're not in the realms of absurdity here. So much to learn from Sweden. All three neighbouring countries adopted a lockdown approach early, which they are now slowly lifting. So they're kind of out the worst of that and they can start doing what we're doing in the UK, which is with some reopening and a bit of a titration with what we're going to see in increasing cases. All three countries have since reopened their borders. That's Denmark, Norway and Finland, but of course not to Sweden. They have not reopened their borders to Sweden. Now, um, 25th of May to the 2nd of June, which we have good data for, most, uh, most coronavirus deaths per capita in Europe. So Sweden had the highest death rate in Europe in that time for which we have good data, 2nd of May to the 2nd of June. Uh, that worked out at uh, 5.29 deaths per million. Uh, the UK was actually the second. Um, there's other reasons going on in the UK, though, but um, we, we went a long way behind. But the point is that compared to the countries around about them, Sweden were doing really quite uh, badly. And I just want to look at that in graphical form as well. So let's have a look at... Um, yeah. New daily confirmed COVID-19 deaths... And this is adjusted for the population. This is a per capita. So we see that down here we have Denmark, Finland and Norway is actually behind that as well. You can't see it. And uh, we just compare that to the, the numbers in Sweden. Again, so we see massively higher uh, numbers in Sweden. We've seen that one, 
That's Kenny. We're not talking to Kenny just now, although we are. He's a very interesting gentleman. Now, this is a daily confirmed, daily versus totally confirmed deaths due to COVID-19. Right, so again, we see Sweden was very much behind the curve and the numbers rose a lot higher in terms of, uh, in terms of deaths. So bo both in terms of graphics and in terms of um, raw figures, we see that Sweden is, has done badly and it did have the most deaths per capita in Europe in that particular time period. Um, and I suspect it may continue to be the case when more up-to-date data becomes available shortly. Now, what's the ongoing national, nationwide uh, study situation? What have studies shown about the overall picture? Now, the 20th of May, I know that's well out of date now, but the point is the herd immunity strategy really didn't seem to be working. 7.3% of uh, Stockholm residents had developed antibodies, uh, according to testing. So now, of course, as we calculated before, as we assumed, that could be about 10%. But it's still not a lot. And this is another vital lesson we need to learn from Sweden. And the World Health Organization agrees with this. About 10% of the population of the Earth, uh, depending wh where you are, but up to 10% on average has been infected with this virus so far. Therefore, has probably developed some sort of immunity. That means that 90% of the world's population are still vulnerable to what is a completely novel virus to them. They have had no exposure to this and they're vulnerable to it. So that means we're about 10% of the way through this pandemic at the moment in terms of the people that could potentially be infected and the proportion of those that could become severely sick and the proportion of those that could die. So I think the other thing this teaches us, we're still near the beginning of this. Sorry this is going on a bit today, but th there's so much important stuff coming out of it. Uh, so, as we say, 11th of May, um, global antibodies, 1 to 10% of the population, according to the World Health Organization. So the World Health Organization warned against any country depending on a herd immunity strategy, as Sweden de facto did. And contact tracing has been largely abandoned since the beginning of March in Sweden. And again... We know now that this is the wrong approach. What we need to do is identify every case, trace the contacts of every case, contact the contacts of every case, advising that they self-isolate for 14 days. We need to attack this pandemic one case, one contact at a time. That's one of the strategies that can ultimately defeat this, this pandemic. So lots to learn from the uh, the Swedish situation. Now, just to give some advantages of what the Swedes have done, of course, they've saved billions of dollars or pounds or euros or whatever currency you want to talk about, that their economy will be in, in much better shape. Uh, they won't have ongoing care costs for many of their elderly sick people because they've died and they won't need to pay to look after them anymore. So economically... For those that haven't died, uh, for those that are still alive in Sweden, the situation is arguably much better. My, my question would be, does this represent the approach of a civilised people? Not saying the, Swede, the Swedes aren't civilised, but is, is this what we want? Do, do you want to um, save some money, which the Swedes undoubtedly have? at the expense of your uh, vulnerable population? That's a question for every country to answer. Um, the, the Swedes made a deliberate uh, choice in that matter. But what concerns me at the moment is, as I've said, many countries are making this choice not by declared strategy, but as a result of the behaviour of uh, large proportions of their population who choose to ignore, uh, for whatever reasons, choose to ignore mask wearing, social distancing, hand hygiene, social isolation, who choose to ignore that en masse. Now, all we have to do now is look at some of my favourite people. I haven't had an I've got lots of favourite people still to go. So, uh, so many of you have been kind enough to send, uh, send things in. Okay, who have we got? This is Jennifer from Florida. 
So uh, excellent face covering, uh, Jennifer. Now, I think it's important to note here that the UK face covering is now uh, mandated in, in public transport, which is, is great. Pity it's not everywhere in public, but public transport's better than nothing. Pity it's not shops as well, but, but there you go. But notice I chose my words carefully there. I didn't say masks, I said face covering. Things to block the physical momentum of the air. So uh, Jennifer is wearing highly appropriate face covering. Thank you for the picture from Florida. Thank you for watching. Oh, this is Jenny. We interviewed uh, Jenny in Tokyo uh, a couple of weeks ago. And um, Jenny's actually uh, preparing some fascinating material for us at the moment. Material as in academic material as opposed to the past material that, that, that Jenny's got there. So do look out for that. It should be with us soon. I'm certainly looking forward to it. And the correspondence I've had with Jenny indicate there's going to be some fascinating things coming out. Uh, this is Joseph. Joseph, I'm, my apologies. I don't know where you are, my friend, but I am delighted that you are watching wherever you are. So thank you for watching, Joseph. Uh, this is Kathy, who watches in San Diego, down in Southern California. Have we had Kathy on before? She's got a very similar pen to mine. Look, look at this. what a coincidence. <laughs> So glad to see you watching, Kathy, in, in San Diego. Thank you for watching. Uh, this is Khalid, who... Oh, Khalid is in Saudi Arabia. Also taking vitamin D supplements. So good to know that people are watching over there in, uh, in the Middle East, in Saudi. Thank you for watching, Khalid. Uh, this is Kim, who's also... Uh, an avid mask maker and I can't quite remember where Kim is my apologies Kim but glad you're watching and glad you're making masks uh, this is Leighton from South Carolina which I imagine is just south of North Carolina so uh, great to know you're watching over there in the Carolinas thank you for watching good picture thank you well your picture's good. Mine's terrible, but there you go. You can't have everything. Yours is good. That's the main thing. Excellent picture. Uh, this is Lisa and Rob who watch in New Jersey. Good to know you're watching in New Jersey. On the eastern seaboard, isn't it? My geography is slowly improving. <laughs> uh, this is uh, Susan. I think Susan's a retired nurse and lives in Perth, Australia. Disappointed to have no pictures so far from Perth in Scotland, but I've had quite a lot from Perth in Australia. <clears throat> Susan's is one of them, so thank you, Susan. Glad to see you're watching. Also glad to see the mask, the glove, the vitamins I assume, the vitamin D I assume, and the hand sanitizer. All excellent, Susan. Thank you very much for that lovely picture. And this is uh, a video I'm not going to show at the moment. That video today is quite long enough. Uh, 